What happened at Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C. on April 14, 1865, is known to all students of American history. At 10.15, as President Lincoln and his wife watch the play Our American Cousin, John Wilkes Booth enters the presidential box. From a distance of four feet, Booth fires a bullet into the president's brain. He leaps from the mezzanine to the stage and dashes toward the back door. A theater stagehand named Edmund Spangler opens the door for Booth. He rushes out to a waiting horse, sweeps down the alley, and disappears into the darkness. What many people do not know, however, are the other events tied to the Booth's conspiracy that occur that same day. Many people do not know that as Booth fires his fatal shot, two men on horseback approach the home of Secretary of State Seward. They have assassination on their minds. One of the men, Lewis Powell, slashes a bodyguard with a knife and races to the bedroom where the secretary lies in bed. Powell stabs him several times, shouting, I'm mad, I'm mad. He rushes down the stairs to find that his fellow conspirator, David Harold, has already fled the scene. He must make his getaway alone on unfamiliar city streets. Also on the 14th, another conspirator, assigned the job of assassinating Vice President Andrew Johnson, lurks around Washington. George Atzerodt rents a room at the Kirkwood House where the vice president is staying and asks a desk clerk about Johnson's whereabouts. He brings with him a loaded revolver, a bowie knife, and three handkerchiefs. To Booth's dismay, Atzerodt can't bring himself to do the job. In yet another part of the Capitol, Michael O'Laughlin drinks and drinks at a hotel bar. Like Atzerodt, he disappoints Booth. His mission, the government prosecutors will later allege, was to assassinate General Ulysses Grant. But at the most, the evidence suggests O'Laughlin scouted out the home of Secretary of War Edwin Stanton. Mary Surratt, the owner of a boarding house in Washington, is busy on the 14th. Surratt travels to a Maryland tavern to make a delivery. The buggy she rides in has been rented for her by John Wilkes Booth. She carries with her a package that Booth will pick up after he shoots the president. The eventful day ends about midnight with the arrival on horseback of John Wilkes Booth and David Harold at the tavern visited hours before by Mary Surratt. Harold bursts into the tavern and grabs two carbines and a bottle of whiskey. He passes the bottle to Booth, takes a swig or two, and then they're off. They head towards the farm of Dr. Samuel Mudd, and at some point during the night, whether in leaping from Lincoln's theater box or in a fall from his horse, Booth has fractured his leg. Mudd treats Booth's leg and constructs for him a pair of crude crutches. This skeleton of the story shows that the assassination of Abraham Lincoln was part of a larger conspiracy, one that involved many men and women and evolved over weeks. In fact, some people believe the conspiracy reached to the very top of the Confederate government. That certainly was the theory of the prosecutors in the Lincoln assassination conspiracy trial. Hours after the president was shot, investigators under the direction of Secretary of War Edwin Stanton started to focus on the boarding house of Mary Surratt. Booth was known to have stayed at the house during his visits in Washington. Military investigators roused Surratt from her bed about four in the morning on the 15th and questioned her about Booth's whereabouts. When the investigators left, Surratt reportedly told her daughter, Anna, come what will, I am resigned. I think J. Wilkes Booth was only an instrument in the hands of the Almighty to punish this proud and licentious people. Two days later, shortly after 11 at night, a team of military investigators again arrived at the Surratt home. While they interviewed Mary Surratt, a man knocked at the door. It was Lewis Powell, the conspirator who assaulted Secretary of State Seward with a knife. Powell was carrying a pickaxe. Asked by the investigators what he was doing there, Powell claimed, improbably, 
to have been hired to dig a gutter. Mary Surratt refused to back up his story. She told investigators, Before God, sir, I do not know this man, and I have never seen him, and I did not hire him to dig a gutter for me. While in the Surratt home, investigators uncovered various pieces of incriminating evidence. They found, for example, a picture of John Wilkes Booth hidden behind another picture on the mantelpiece. Facing arrest, Surratt asked a minute to kneel and pray. So Surratt and Powell were both taken into custody. William Bell, Secretary Seward's servant, identified Powell as the man who had stabbed the secretary. The investigation produced three more arrests that same day. Edmund Spangler was arrested after investigators gathered reports from theatergoers suggesting that he had aided Booth's escape from Ford's Theater. Samuel Arnold was arrested in Virginia after he was determined to have been the author of an incriminating letter found in a search of the trunk at Booth's hotel room. In his letter to Booth, Arnold had written, You know full well the government's suspicion something is going on here. Therefore, the undertaking is becoming more complicated. Arnold's arrest helped break the conspiracy case. He identified seven individuals he met the previous month when the plan was to kidnap, not to kill, the president. Yes, the assassination conspiracy of April 14th was Plan B. Plan A, probably backed by the Confederate government in Richmond, was to kidnap Lincoln and take him behind Confederate lines to Richmond. The idea was to release Lincoln only when the Union agreed to release captured Confederate soldiers. The plan fell through, though, when Lincoln changed plans on the day that the plot was to be executed. Arnold's tip then led to the arrest of O'Loughlin and Azeroth. When first interviewed by investigators, Dr. Samuel Mudd said that the man whose leg he fixed was a stranger to him. A search of Mudd's home three days later turned up a left foot riding boot with the name John Wilkes Booth in it. Mudd claimed not to have noticed the writing. He also claimed not to recognize a photo of Booth. But investigators knew from talking to Mudd's neighbors that Mudd and Booth had been seen together that previous November. So Mudd became the seventh conspirator arrested. On the 26th of April, then, 20, 12 days after the assassination, investigators closed in on their main prey. Booth and Harold were hiding in a barn in Virginia. The suspects were told to get out or the barn would be set on fire. Booth tried to bargain, but failed. Pine boughs were placed against the barn. Booth yelled, there's a man who wants to come out. David Harold stepped out of the barn and was apprehended. With the fire raging around him, Booth appeared at the door of the barn. He carried a carbine. A shot rang out and Booth fell. He was carried into the farmhouse where he died two hours later. With the arrest of Harold, the government had in his custody the seven men and one woman it would try for a conspiracy to murder the president and other officials. But how and where should they be tried? Secretary Stanton favored a quick military trial and execution. Edward Bates, Lincoln's former attorney general, disagreed. He favored a trial in a civilian court. Bates argued that the use of a military trial would be unconstitutional. Bates said, if the offenders are done to death by that tribunal, however truly guilty, they will pass for martyrs with half the world. President Johnson asked his own attorney general, James Speed, to prepare an opinion on the legality of a military trial. Speed concluded that the use of a military court was lawful and proper. He reasoned that the attack on the commander-in-chief came before the full cessation of the rebellion by the Confederate States, and thus the assassination was a war crime. It's true that by April 14th, General Lee had surrendered for the Army of Northern Virginia, but the Confederate States of America had not formally ceased hostilities. As an act of war then, Speed said, the War Department and not the judicial branch was the appropriate body to run the trial. Johnson agreed, and on May 1, 1865, 
he ordered the alleged conspirators to be tried before a nine-person military commission. The commission convened for the first time a week later in a newly created courtroom on the third floor of the old Arsenal Penitentiary in Washington. The voting members of the commission included eight generals and a colonel. Judge Advocate General Joseph Holt served in the problematic roles, dual roles, of chief prosecutor and legal advisor to the commission. John A. Bingham served in the commission as a special judge advocate and both examined witnesses and gave the government's summation. Testimony began on May 12th. Now that's just three days after the prisoners were first informed of the charges against them and asked if they would like to have legal counsel. Apart from this distressingly short time to prepare for trial, the defendants had other things stacked against them as well. Under the rules of the commission, they would be convicted by a simple majority vote, and a majority of two-thirds can impose the death penalty. Also, while their lawyers could call witnesses on their behalf, the defendants themselves were not allowed to testify. The military trial would take seven weeks. The commission heard from 371 witnesses. Over the course of it all, spectators lucky enough to get admission passes freely moved in and out of the courtroom. A surprisingly nonchalant atmosphere for such a very important trial. The War Department saw the trial as an opportunity to prosecute not only the eight charged conspirators, but also Jefferson Davis and the Confederate Secret Service. Prosecutors suggested that as the war turned in favor of the Union, the Confederacy got desperate. They began to support schemes that would have been rejected under other circumstances. Witnesses described Confederate plots to destroy public buildings, burn steamboats, poison the public water supply of New York City, and even mount a biological attack. Witness Godfrey Hyams described a meeting with Confederate operatives who hoped to infect clothing in Bermuda with yellow fever, smallpox, and other contagious diseases. Under this plan, eight trunks of the infected clothing would have been given to or sold to Union troops, while one trunk would have been placed in a valise and presented to President Lincoln. Hyams told the tribunal that the operation's mastermind, a Dr. Luke Blackburn, promised him $60,000 for his role in distributing the infected goods. But Hyams testified that he developed qualms about his role. He refused to deliver the infected trunk as a donation to President Lincoln. He did, however, place the other eight trunks in channels of distribution near concentrations of Union soldiers. A few of the trunks of infected clothing were auctioned off near a Union base of operations in North Carolina. Shortly thereafter, nearly 2,000 citizens and soldiers died in an area during a massive yellow fever outbreak. In a summation, Special Judge Advocate John Bingham attributed the epidemic to the Confederate plot. He did not know, nor did anyone at the time, that mosquitoes, not people, spread yellow fever. What is the relevance of this testimony to the guilt or innocence of the eight defendants? Not much. It shows how much prosecutors hope to use this trial to completely di discredit the Confederacy in the eyes of the public. If he had only been in custody at the time, John Bingham would have put Jefferson Davis in the dock. As it was, Bingham effectively tried Davis in absentia. He presented evidence, some of it highly questionable, that Davis approved of the assassination plot and authorized the use of funds from a Confederate bank account in Montreal to pay for it. In a summation for the government, Bingham went so far as to claim that, quote, Jefferson Davis is as clearly proven guilty of this conspiracy as John Wilkes Booth, by whose hand Jefferson Davis inflicted the mortal wound upon Abraham Lincoln. Apart from the testimony about wide-ranging schemes to terrorize the North, the prosecution presented evidence of not just one plot against Lincoln and the other leaders, but two. The first plot was that abandoned plot to kidnap Lincoln. 
there were also evolving plans on exactly how to pull that off. And getting him from Washington to Richmond was never going to be very easy either. As fantastic as it seems, Booth's initial idea was to kidnap Lincoln at, yes, Ford's Theater. In Samuel Arnold's statement, he said his role in the plot would have been to catch the president when he was thrown out of the box at the theater. Actor Samuel Chester testified that Booth tried to recruit his participation in the plot beginning as early as November 1864. Chester said that Booth offered him money in exchange for his proposed role, upon a signal to open a door at the rear of the stage. By April of 1865, the facts on the ground had changed to the point where success for any kidnapping plot became all but impossible. Booth gave up on the idea of kidnapping Lincoln and began thinking about how best to kill him. For the defendants Arnold and O'Loughlin, their main line of defense in the trial was that while they were on board with the kidnapping plot, they did nothing whatsoever to further the assassination plot. Arnold's attorney argued that Arnold, quote, backed out of this insane scheme of capture about the middle of March. There's a problem with that argument, of course. The military tribunal would not look too kindly on people who, even for a while, supported a plot to kidnap the president. O'Loughlin had an additional problem. How did he explain away the prosecution witness who put him at the war secretary's home the night before the assassination? Each of the eight defendants played different roles in the assassination conspiracy. The evidence of guilt for each was different as well. The guilt of Lewis Powell, David Harrell, and George Atzerodt was clear almost beyond question. There was simply no conceivable way that any of these men could win acquittal, and a death sentence for each was an all but foregone conclusion. Which is not to say defense attorneys didn't give it their best shot. Take William Doster, who represented Lewis Powell, who attacked the Secretary of State. Doster argued Powell's life should be spared because he suffered from a fanaticism that bordered on insanity. He lives in that land of imagination, Doster said, where it seems to him legions of Southern soldiers wait to crown him as their chief commander. Doster described Powell as an innocent farm boy turned assassin by circumstances beyond his control. We know now that slavery made him immoral, that war made him a murderer, and that necessity, revenge, and delusion made him an assassin. Doster ended his eloquent plea for Powell's life by asking the commission to let him live, if not for his sake, but for our own. Doster also represented George Atzerodt, but his line of defense for this client was a little different. I intend to show, Doster told the commission, that this man is a constitutional coward, that if he had been assigned the duty of assassinating the vice president, he could never have done it. Doster even presented defense witnesses who described Atzerodt as a notorious coward and as a man remarkable for his cowardice. While David Harrell's attorney, Frederick Stone, placed his slender hope for saving Harrell's life on his client's simple-mindedness and youth. One defense witness said of Harold, in mind I consider him about 11 years of age, which for Stone showed that Harold was, quote, only wax in the hands of a man like Booth. Ford's theater stagehand, Edmund Spangler, played only a bit part in this plot. Unfortunately for him, prosecutors had several witnesses who made his willing participation seem likely. For example, a props man for the theater testified that he saw Booth enter the back door of the theater and asked Spangler, Ned, you'll help me all you can, won't you? Spangler's defense attorney, Thomas Ewing, argued that while the prosecution evidence might suggest that Spangler agreed to assist Booth, it failed to prove that Spangler was aware of Booth's guilty purposes. He had a point. If any of the eight defendants was overcharged by the prosecution, it was Ned Spangler. 
The cases against the other two defendants, Dr. Samuel Mudd and Mary Surratt, were circumstantial and are the most controversial. First, Mudd. The prosecution showed that, though through the testimony of several witnesses, that Mudd and Booth enjoyed a much closer relationship than the doctor would admit. Witnesses placed the two men together in Maryland. They testified that Mudd helped Booth buy a horse, most likely the very horse that Booth used in his flight from Board's Theater. A minister testified that he saw Mudd enter Mary Surratt's home in early March. Then, of course, there were Mudd's denials and lies to investigators. Investigator Alexander Lovett testified that Mudd appeared suspicious from the start. When we first asked Dr. Mudd whether two strangers had been there, he seemed very much excited and got pale as a sheet of paper and blew about his lips like a man frightened at something he had done. Three witnesses, including two of Mudd's own slaves, testified that Mudd was a hardcore racist who wished the president dead. But defense attorney Thomas Ewing argued that Mudd's only prior encounter with Booth had been the one in November, and that the, all the other alleged meetings were fabrications of prosecution witnesses. Ewing contended that it was no crime to fix a broken leg, even if it was the leg of a presidential assassin. Ewing argued that the prosecution failed to prove that his client actually furthered the conspiracy in any way. Prosecutors responded by noting that Mudd pointed out to Harold and Booth the route that they should take upon leaving Mudd's farm. That, said the prosecutors, furthered the conspiracy. No defendant's case, however, was more contested and more debated than that of Mary Surratt. President Andrew Johnson called her the keeper of the nest that hatched the egg. Without question, Booth and other conspirators had been frequent visitors at Surratt's boarding house. But evidence of association with conspirators is not by itself enough to sustain a conviction. Prosecutors had to show that Surratt took specific actions that furthered the conspiracy. It is clear that she lied to investigators. Police witnesses testified she claimed not to know Lewis Powell after he stumbled into her home. But lying is not enough for conviction either. The most incriminating evidence against Surratt came from two witnesses, Lewis Whiteman and John Lloyd. Whiteman, a boarder at Surratt's house, described a buggy trip with Mary Surratt on the afternoon of the assassination to Surratt's tavern in Maryland. The tavern was part of a farmhouse where Mary had previously lived with her husband, John. John had died in 1862 and Mary had rented out the tavern when she opened her DC boarding house in 1864. Ostensibly, the purpose of the buggy trip was to collect a debt, but the real reason appears to have been to deliver a package to the tavern proprietor, John Lloyd. The package contained field glasses, that is binoculars we call them today, although Whiteman said he didn't know the contents at the time. Whiteman testified that while Mrs. Surratt went inside, he bided his time outside and in the bar. When Lloyd showed up, he and Surratt had a conversation in what Whiteman called low tones. He could not make out what they said. Whiteman also told the tribunal that later that evening, only an hour before the assassination, John Wilkes Booth showed up for a final time at Surratt's boarding house. After the visit, according to Whiteman, Surratt's demeanor changed. She became very nervous, agitated, and restless. But the most damning evidence against Surratt came from John Lloyd himself. He testified that five to six weeks before the assassination, David Harold, George Atzerott, and Mary's son, John Surratt Jr., dropped off two carbines and ammunition at his tavern. Lloyd testified that three days before the assassination, Mary Surratt told him that the shooting irons left at his place by the men would be needed soon. And then on the day of the assassination, Surratt again brought up the subject, according to Lloyd. When I got home, I found Mrs. Surratt there. She told me to have those shooting irons ready that night. There would be some parties who would call for them. She gave me something wrapped in a piece of paper, 
which I took upstairs and found to be a field glass. She told me to get two bottles of whiskey ready and that these things were to be called for that night. Surratt's attorney, Frederick Aiken, argued that Lloyd's evidence should be disbelieved because Lloyd admitted to drinking heavily on the afternoon of the assassination. According to a bartender called as a defense witness, Lloyd was drinking right smartly. Moreover, said Aiken, Lloyd was motivated to exculpate himself by placing blame on Mary Surratt. On the second point, there is little doubt. Lloyd almost certainly faced a choice between either testifying against Surratt or being charged himself. Finally, Aiken argued there was no direct evidence that Surratt knew Booth planned to assassinate the president. Aiken suggested that Surratt may have unintentionally aided Booth's escape, but that nothing she did showed an intent to further a murder. From the standpoint of the commission, Surratt had a problem. They clearly believe that Booth let Surratt in on his plans for Ford Theater. If that were true, then Mary Surratt could have gone to the authorities and prevented the assassination of the president. She chose not to do that. On May 29, 1865, the military commission met in secret session to review the evidence. After a day of deliberations, they reached their verdicts. The commission found seven of the prisoners guilty of at least one of the conspiracy charges. Ned Spangler was guilty only of aiding and abetting Booth's escape. He got six years. Arnold, Mudd, and O'Laughlin were sentenced to hard labor for life. Powell, Atzerodt, Harold, and Surratt were sentenced to be hanged by the neck until dead. The commission sent its recommendations to President Johnson for his review. Five of the nine commission members recommended, because of her age and sex, that the president reduce Mary Surratt's punishment to life in prison. Johnson approved all of the commission sentences, including the death sentence for Surratt. And on July 6th, the four condemned prisoners were told they would hang the next day. Surratt's lawyers mounted a frantic effort to save their client's life. They hurriedly prepared a petition for habeas corpus, arguing that the tribunal that tried Surratt was unconstitutional. The morning of the scheduled execution, Surratt's attorney succeeded in convincing a federal district judge to issue the requested writ, but the victory was short-lived. President Johnson quashed the effort to save Surratt when he issued an executive order suspending the writ of habeas corpus in cases such as this. At 1.30 on a hot afternoon, July 7, 1865, the traps of the gallows installed in the courtyard of the old arsenal building was sprung. Almost no one expected Mary Surratt to be among the four prisoners on the platform. But she was, becoming the first woman ever executed by the United States. The surviving prisoners were taken to prison at Fort Jefferson in the desolate Dry Tartugas, Florida. Two years later, a yellow fever epidemic swept the prison and claimed the life of O'Laughlin. On March 1, 1869, the last full day of President Johnson's term, Mudd, Arnold, and Spangler received pardons. Now, over the years, critics have attacked the verdicts, the sentences, and the procedures of the 1865 Military Commission. Without a doubt, the trial fell far short of the usual standards for fairness in criminal trials. On the other hand, the Commission members clearly did, did weigh the evidence and made distinctions between levels of guilt. This was an unusual conspiracy, and these were unusual times. The government had strong reasons to seek avoiding a prolonged and unpredictable search for justice in a civilian court. In the government's very worst nightmare, Confederate sympathizing defense attorneys might have used these criminal trials to stir up support for Confederate causes. We'll see the same concerns exactly expressed by Allied powers in Nuremberg. The Allies' answer was, like here, to create a specially commissioned court, one that could put strict limitations on the available defenses. 
for Nazi defendants. As it turned out, the Booth conspiracy killed a president, but in so doing, it made Lincoln a martyr. Booth and his accomplices hoped to be remembered in the South as heroes, but largely their hopes were not realized. For most Southerners, the assassination plot was an embarrassment. Booth, a well-known actor himself, may have opened his own play in Ford's Theater that April night, and it certainly was dramatic, but it did not have the ending he hoped for, and few in his audience applauded his performance. 